this is the problems class then to go with the uh, said theory, the axiomatic lectures. Uh, I think it's, it's your best work if it's some kind of conversation at least and isn't just me just talking for 50 minutes. I got sent through a couple of queries, people who wanted um, something talked about. So again, you can suggest a topic on, on the chat uh, if you wish. I, one request was just to have some kind of recap about ordinal numbers. <clears throat> so let me just say a bit about that. Uh, my intention is also to do something that perhaps one would have had in a logic course. And for people who come from outside, who might not have seen, for example, the Lervenheim Skolem theorem. And this is something that will be useful as part of our part of our course that's coming. But first, let me just say a bit, a bit about sketch something about the ordinal numbers. <clears throat> So this was uh, uh, Cantor's great invention, was to extend the natural numbers by transfinite numbers. So he posited that after the natural numbers comes another ordinal number, omega. <coughs> And then we have omega plus one, omega plus two, and omega plus n, and so on. <clears throat> and actually squashing this picture down a little bit, we have omega, we run through all of these things and we get omega plus omega. And the idea that this looks like a copy of omega followed by another copy of omega. So here's a copy of omega, and here I am starting to write out another copy of omega. And then there'd be omega plus omega plus another copy of omega after that, and so on. So Ordinals come in three kinds. Well, what is an ordinal number? It's a transitive set, well ordered by epsilon. So this is the definition of an, an ordinal number any transitive set, but it has this very special property that epsilon is a well order. And we define, we can define a less than on ordinal numbers that extends the ordinary less than on the natural numbers by using this epsilon here. So three here, zero, one, two the set of its predecessors. So this is a, well, sorry, let me say, say a little bit more. Get some space here. So we start out here. So each natural number is the set of its predecessors. So this is zero, this is zero and this is one. And in general, n plus one is the set zero up to n here. Now each of these sets is transitive and it's well ordered by epsilon. Here we have zero as a member of one. It's only finite, and so it's a well ordering. Here we've just got uh, n plus one things, 
right? And I've got that zero is a member of one, is a member of two, is a member dot dot dot, is a member of n, and all of these things are themselves members of n plus one. So n plus one is transitive. Any element is also a subset. And here it is, it's a strict total order, it is chain, so it's well ordered, this is finite. But omega is no different. Omega is the set of its predecessors. Except that there are now infinitely many things in here, but again it's a strict total order. It's a chain of objects, each of which is a member of the next in the chain. So all natural numbers are in omega. Omega plus one is then <coughs> all of this lot here, but it also has omega. So I can think of this as omega together with a singleton union omega. And that would be true for each of these previous it's here. n plus 1 is simply n together with singleton n here. And again, so of course this is this is just just the beginning. Um, and we can use the fact that uh, the elements of an ordinal are well ordered to do recursions along the ordinal. In general, if you want to do a recursion, either a recursion on the natural numbers or on the along ordinals or along epsilon, you need a well-founded relation. For natural numbers or ordinals, you need a well-ordering. Right? So we, in general, you can define things by recursion and then you prove that the recursion works by induction. So given a well order, or indeed well-founded relation, let's call it R, say, we can <coughs> define functions do recursions along the well-founded relation. So we prove that such recursions work by induction, again, over the well-founded relation R. So, I think of an ordinal as being a picture of a certain kind of type of well ordering. So omega, a picture of omega is like this. And there are many other well orderings that have the same picture. And this is supposed to look like omega. Now this well ordering, it might be on a set A, and here is the well order relation. So the underlying substratum of the ordering is not necessarily the natural numbers, it might be something else. Right? But I'll say that this well order is isomorphic to this if I can find a order preserving bijection between the elements. 
like this. So this is isomorphic to this ordinal with epsilon if there is some function which goes between a and alpha and it's a bijection and it's order preserving. So for all u and v in a f of u is epsilon below f of v. And we have a theorem due to Miramonov that every well ordering is isomorphic to an ordinal. So some well orderings will look different. This one might look like omega plus two, in which case there'd be two more things over here. So if I wanted this to be isomorphic to an ordinal, I'd have to pick omega plus two up here. And then I could, by induction, I, sorry, by recursion, I can line all of these up, and then these two here have to go at the end. Now, actually, to prove this theorem, actually, one needs the axiom of replacement. But that's incidental at the moment. So the moral is every well order is isomorphic to an ordinal. So we, we've got this kind of equivalence class of all of these pictures of well orderings that have the same picture. And so there are all of these well orderings that look like omega. And of course, omega looks like omega. So I can think of the ordinal as picking out for me a canonical example from the equivalence class of all the well orderings that have the same order type that look like omega. So in general, that's what we can think of. An ordinal as picking out a canonical example from a particular equivalence class of well orderings of the same type. Since we have ordinals like this, right, we can then define things like ordinal arithmetic. Here is the adding alpha function. I define by recursion alpha plus zero to be zero. This is what I'm going to define by meaning I'm adding alpha, so pre-adding alpha to various betas. So I'm defining this, sorry, to be alpha. The next clause of the definition says I'll define alpha plus the excessor of beta in terms of what I already know. I'm assuming I know alpha plus beta. So this will just be alpha plus beta, successor of this, which we more normally write as alpha plus beta plus one. And if lambda is a limit ordinal, So by a limit ordinal, this means that <coughs> lambda is an ordinal. We write on for being an ordinal, but it's not plus one of anything, but it's not a successor of anything. And it's not the case that there is some ordinal beta where beta plus one is lambda. So I don't get that lambda is just the successor of something. It has to be like omega or omega plus omega. So in this case, we define this to be the supremum of all of the previous ordinals. Assuming I've already defined this. So in this way, I can define by recursion alpha plus beta for any alpha and beta. And for a fixed alpha, I can prove that this is a uniquely defined function by, by induction here. Another way of thinking of this is just as the union of all of the 
alpha plus betas as this. Supremum then being the least ordinal that's larger than all of these. And that turns out to be just the same as the big union. And there are similar clauses for multiplication of ordinals, there's an m alpha beta function, and there's an exponentiation. So again, see the course notes for the set theory course if, you've, uh, if you're unfamiliar with this or you want to revise these. So again, these are on my teaching website under the set theory course within rather than the axiomatic set theory course. Okay. Um, so this was just a rough run through of ordinals. I don't know if that's what was wanted. Um, again, just ask me if you want to, uh, want me to say any more there. Okay, no one's saying anything. Okay, fine. Um, let me talk then, if there's no, no other questions have come through, let me talk then a little bit about the downward Leuvenheim scholar theorem, right, which will give a chance to introduce some kind of logical uh, concepts. And we will be using this form of proof in one or two places in the course. So it's useful to I think useful to go through this thing from the, the, the third year logic course and we're expressing it in our in our terms here. Okay, so I propose to do that, propose to do that next. Oh, so let me let me just say then. Uh, you could at this point turn to the appendix of the notes. I'll be talking there from, um, find the page number. So this will be page 75 of the notes. Right, introduce 74, 75 of the notes. Okay, so the idea is that uh, of the lerman scholem theorem is that if you've got a structure, you know, a mathematical structure, or it could be uh, a structure in data science, it could be uh, more or less any structure where you can describe it using a kind of simple first order languages, which quantify over individuals, rather than quantifying over properties or families. And what the theorem says is that you might have some mathematically very large structure, but actually if you've, you know, for example, the real line is an uncountable infinite structure, just the real line R with less than, but our language which we use to talk about reals is typically is countable. Right? We only have countably many variables. We have a certain number of constants. 
perhaps we can define the natural numbers, which is again a countable collection. So actually we can find a subfield of the reals which actually have all the same properties that the full real line does. This is perhaps slightly surprising at first. This is kind of as a basis of uh, Skolem's paradox. So although we, we, we can prove that the real line is uncountable, in our ordinary language, we can actually only say countably many things about that, that real line. So roughly speaking, one could just take all of the countably many things that we can define using our language, and actually that would suffice for all of our mathematics, right? because we couldn't define anything else. Not without using some extra logical tools of some other kind. So the downward lemon and Skolem theorem says basically if I've got a structure of some large cardinality, if my language is countable, I can always find a substructure, a field, a subfield, a structure, substructure, which is which is countable and which has all of the same expressible properties that the whole structure does. And it's, in fact, a kind of spin-off of the Gödel completeness theorem. So we'll see, just to kind of fix some terminology, we'll fix how we're going to talk about this and actually give, give some example of how it, give a proof of, of how this, this proof, uh, of how this theorem works. So <coughs> let me just arrange some things here. So I'll try and put the, the statements that are there on 74, page 74 and 75 in the setting of said theory, but it's in general theorem about logical structures. It's not about set, particularly about said theory at all. So, you know, we were talking about things like collections of sets defined by terms. So, let's think about such collections. I may have a collection of sets W here defined for me by some term or other, doesn't matter what. And it sits inside a, a larger collection. Z here. So I've got W is contained in Z. Now we talked about how a statement might have a kind of different truth value in W or Z last time. Well, what we want to think about is when particular relationship between these two structures is not only that this is a substructure of Z, the epsilon relation is the same here and here, but actually it's a so-called elementary substructure. And the word elementary means that basically anything I can say here about objects from W, I can say here too. So we say that W epsilon is an elementary substructure of Z here. And we write this with a curly less than here. And the idea is, I could take if I could take any formula phi, and let's say it's got three variables in it, v zero up to v n. Uh, 
and for any w little w zero up to w n here. So I take all of these from in here, inside W. Um, let's say phi, and I'll write these as just W vector to abbreviate. This is supposed to hold. This holds in W epsilon, if and only if it does in Z. So it has the same truth value in here as it does in here. So uh, Let me just think if there's some. Okay, compare with fields, mathematical fields. <clears throat> I suppose W is the rationals and Z is the reals. <clears throat> now, when we talk about the reals and the rationals, we're not talking about epsilons. We think perhaps that W is a structure where you've got the rationals here and you've got less than and you've got plus and you've got times and you have zero. And perhaps the language has constants for the natural numbers. And R is, sorry, Z is the same, but we take the reals here. So Q is contained in the reals. Now, consider two times two equals four, and this statement. Of course, this holds in the rationals if and only if it holds in the reals. I mean, it's almost too obvious to be worth saying, but we're just so used to thinking of Q as just being a subset of R here. If it does so in, Z, in, in the reals. Z. So I don't know why I'm drawing brackets around things. <laughs> But here we would say that W is not an elementary substructure of Z because there are things that are true in R which are definitely not true in Q. There exists X such that X times X equals two, right? This holds in R, but not in Z, but not in So we would not say here. So here we would say that W is not an elementary substructure of Z. Okay, so, but we're interested if we go back to the set theoretic or if we concentrate again on the set theoretic situation is that we're interested in situations where we do have chunks of sets where we have this relationship that anything that's true about parameters or objects or gadgets from W it's true here if and only if it's true there. Just in the same sense that two squared is four, this holds in W or if and only if it holds in the reals. Now you could see, for example, why, or one reason why 
Q is not elementary substructure of R, simply because the square root of two, for example, is missing from Q. Whereas I can write a, a formula down here about R and that explicitly says or declares there is something that's the square root of two. And we know that there are a couple of objects in R that will satisfy this, but there are none in Q. So what we could do is enlarge Q by adding on a square root of two. So we would take a larger field here. We'd adjoin the square root of two, right? And I'm still inside R. And now this statement becomes true in this larger field that's in between. So the idea of the Lerven Home Skolem theorem is that essentially you throw in everything into Q, which you could define by some formula or other here. And so you fatten up Q so that it's got solutions to all of these kind of expressions here. And if you fatten it up enough, you'll find some field that's in between. I mean, there's no standard um, notation for this. If we fatten this up enough, we could find a field that would still be countable because we've only got countably many expressions here, but in which anything I could say about the objects in here holds equally well here or here. So I would have a Q that would be countable. All right, so it's the same size as Q in cardinality as Q here. And moreover, I could say this was an elementary substructure of R. And the levenheim skolem theorem justifies this for me. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, so look, let's look at the uh, tarski vort criterion at the top of page 75. <clears throat> so it's due to these two logicians here. And I'll take the particular case again of talking about sets rather than the reals of the rationals and so it gives a criterion for when we have elementary substructure hood we'll say that this is an elementary substructure of this if for all formulae phi zero to Vn here. And if I pick any gadgets here that are in W, little W1 up to Wn, let's suppose if there is an X in W, such that phi w vector, sorry, comma z here, holds in z, then there actually is an x, I'm sorry, I got this wrong. If I look at the formula phi, I interpret it in z, now it's about these gadgets W, right? the W is being subclass of Z. So in Z are these ve W vector. So if Z sees there is an X that will make, oh dear, this is X, that will make this true. So if there is an X in Z that'll make this true in Z, then there is an X in W 
here that will make this true. And double. So with the definition of elementary substructure hood, it required talking about all formulae. It's the, the task of all criterion says actually you only have to concentrate on this situation. As long whenever you find, for example, when z with the reals, if you can find a square root of two in the reals, there's a square root of two in the smaller structure. That will satisfy the equation for being a square root of two. So if there is an x in z that makes this true, there's one in w. Now, if I've got this for all phi's and all vectors of things I can put into the free variables for phi, then actually for all formulae, they'll have the same truth value in both, both structures here. So how does the Lovenheim-Skolem theorem then work from, from that? Well, it's helpful to name certain functions. These are called Skolem functions. Suppose you're given a well order of z here. I suppose I've got a formula of the kind that I might be interested in. There is an x such that phi x holds of these other variables here. So this is in our language of set theory here. Then to each formula phi, existentially quantified like this, we define a function. So the Skolem function, h sub phi, right? It doesn't have to be everywhere defined. It's the partial function h sub phi of these things. It picks out an x for me that'll make phi true. And it uses the well order I've got of z. So in the notes, I call this a triangle for the order. So if this is defined right here, this is the triangle least in the well ordering of Z, the triangle least X such that phi X of the Y's holds. So I've got countably many formulae and there are therefore countably many of these Skolem functions. So how does the Skolem, Lovenham Skolem theorem work? This is a, a nine. So it's called D for downward, meaning we look for smaller cardinalities. So let W here, this be a sub class of Z here as above. Um, no, sorry. Let me just take Z. I take a bunch of objects from Z. And the idea is going to be that I get a close up x under these Skolem functions and I'm going to arrive at a structure which is an elementary substructure of z.
So there's an elementary substructure. Substructure. W. Here. Yeah, X is contained in the domain of W. And we can also say that we didn't have to, we only had to throw in countably many things. X itself, we, don't, we haven't said anything about the sizes of Z here, but so if X is infinite, we can end up with a W the same size as X. And the cardinality of W is the same as the cardinality of X. Well, X might have been the empty set, or maybe X had only got 23 things in it. So actually we add on here, omega or alpha zero many things. If X is already infinite, then you can ignore this because then the cardinality of x is always already at least L over zero. So we close up. X under the scolum functions. So, let H be the set of the, of the H phi. As phi varies over the language. And we just by recursion on the natural numbers, just enlarge X so that it works. We just set x0 to be our initial x. And what is xn plus 1? Assuming xn is defined. Well, I apply the scolum functions that I've got to the xn. Right? And I've got countably many functions and I apply it to this set here. Well, look at the functions that are in h here. And I'll just take the union of all of these things. So I just apply the scolum functions to all of the xn's and just smush them, smush them all together. And w will be just the union of these x's. Union of the k of these xk's. So now what I've done is take this thing of this particular cardinality, let's suppose it's infinite. I threw in countably many things here each time, countably many functions applied to the set Xn. So at each stage, I didn't make this set here any larger than Xn was. So I keep the size of Xn. As long as x zero is at least is at least infinite. But now the claim is that I've got an elementary substructure. Sorry, Z, epsilon. And that's by the tarski vort criteria above. The idea is that what do we do by closing under the scolum function? The scolum function says, throw in an X that makes phi XY true. 
what's the task you've wrought criterion set? This will be an elementary substructure if for every phi, if I've got an x, if there exists an x in z, there exists an x in w. But that's exactly what we're aiming at here. We keep throwing in potential, I mean, potential little x's that witness phi x holds on some vector of things from xn. So by design, we have the tasky vort criterion holding. Between W, this union, and Z. Why? Because if I've got some formula phi Bn, and if I've got W1 up to Wn in W, it's finitely many things in here. W is the union of these xk's. So there's going to be a k which has each of these things. For some k, w1 up to wn is in xk. And indeed in all subsequent xk plus 1, xk plus 2 and so on. But then by application of the Skolem function, relevant for this formula phi here, if there is an x in z such that phi x w vector then actually what we have is phi h phi w vector w vector holds because h phi picked out a suitable x for us it picked out the triangle least one but h phi of w vector here is in xk plus 1 because xk plus 1 was a result of applying h phi's to all the tuples from xk so this gadget is then in the final W. Okay. So we're finished here, QED. So this, so the conclusion is I can start from any, I can start from any collection of sets given to me like this. And you could give me some starting collection, randomly given sets X. And the Lerman Scullum theorem says I could in case this x in some w so now all of my formulae are absolute between w and z formulae about things from w and for any phi vn any w0 up to wn I have phi w vector holds in w if and only if it does in x. Sorry, z. So phi is then absolute between this w and z.
we say it's upwards absolute because if phi of w vector holds in w, that persists upwards into z, and it's downwards absolute because if z thinks phi holds of these gadgets in w, that goes down to w. So it's absolute in both directions there. Okay. Um, I've got a quite a long private question from somebody, which I'll, I'll answer afterwards. Is there anything that I can say publicly or any, anything that one, anybody wants to ask publicly here before we finish? I have a okay. quick question on terminology. Yes, sir, Sorry, yeah. it's just about when you when um, you list all the different axioms, you refer to um, F as a class term, but then also a function in um, one yeah. of them. I'm just confused what you mean by that. Well, um, I can define a class term, and it might be that it defines a class of ordered pairs, in which case it will be defining a relation. But it might be that those ordered pairs, I could think of that as actually being a function because they're perhaps single valued ordered pairs. So when I say let F be okay. a class yeah. term that's also a function, I'm just saying it's a class of ordered pairs, which is single valued in that sense. All right, thank you. Is that, that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Okay. <clears throat> 